Okay? Not because they've done an economic ev evaluation, they've done it in the right way or in the approach that you think it should be the, the most, like the closer to, to what um, a proper economic evaluation should be. Okay? So with that's off the record because I was talking interestingly. Was that um, about, you know, evidence on the literature and things like that? Like you are more likely to come across some studies in which you say, yeah, why they've done this, why they've randomized in this way, why they just don't report where they get this data from, how they come up with these numbers. So, I mean, if you find yourself in this situation, it's, it's perfectly fine. Right. Let's talk about discounting now. Um, we moved from defining the perspective of the study to actually setting for how long we are going to be um, doing the economic evaluation, so our time horizon. Now let's um, talk about the issue of discounting. I don't know whether you are familiar with discounting methods, are you? Do you have an idea of why we discount <coughs> in economics? No? Yeah, Okay, fine. I can give you an example later on as well. But basically, you are going to be discounting, and I'm not telling yet whether only costs or outcomes. We can talk about it later. Um, because there are differences, in a way, okay, between um, costs and outcomes. Costs are quite simple. Costs are money, right? Um, and it's about <coughs> the preference that we have <coughs> in terms of having money today or tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, okay? Think about an influx of, um, of money, okay? Think about five years today, so this year, and four years more. What's going to happen if you have a flow of costs in those five years? Is um, the same a cost that you incur now is it worth the same as the cost that you will incur next year? Increase. Hmm? Increase. It increases? Next year. So if you have to put that costing in one value today, <coughs> okay, what you have to do is to actually bring it from the future to the present. And in general, not only now for economic evaluation, in general this is like doing a net present value calculation, okay? When you have uh, monies today and monies that come in future periods, okay, and you want to really um, put them together so that you can put them in a comparable way, you can always bring them from the future, that sounds like a bit <laughs> funny, but from the future to the present, okay? Um, you do this for different reasons. One of them is because of preferences that individuals typically have with respect to money, and uh, they prefer money today than in the future. And this is related to another, you know, to some, you know, things that we talk in economics about the uh, decreasing utility of, uh, of uh, future income, okay? Um, but the idea is that basically you will have to discount costs no matter what, okay? Because we are talking about money, and the cost that we are going to be paying today are not worth the same that the cost that um, are go you, you, you know, we are going to be paying next year. Think about your savings account, okay? Um, your savings account have money this year, okay? And next year, okay, they will have an interest rate, right? And then the following year, the interest rate will add. Now interest rates are not very good, but, you know. Um, so every year you are accumulating interest rate because you had an initial capital and then it grows, okay? In a way, imagine that all the money that you are going to have, your, your initial, you know, money plus what you gain from in the interest, in three years' time, you are bringing it back to today. It's like, you know, bringing an amount of money that you are going to have in three years' time and putting, putting it in values of today. So that's the idea of doing discounting. When it comes to discounting costs in economic evaluation, it's about bringing of all the, um, the flow of costs that you are going to be incurring in today, in next year, in two years' time, three years' time, four years' time, um, and for however long you are considering your, uh, your economic evaluation, 
then you have to actually bring the costs into the net present value. You have to discount the costs so that we are comparing, you know, costs at today's value. Okay? Um, this discounting is um, reflecting a few things. As I was mentioning, one is um, the, time the time preference that individuals typically have. It also has corrections for the effect of inflation. This is how extra we are paying for our consumption of goods. And also, it has to do with the social opportunity costs. Okay? In um, economics, you have the concept of opportunity costs as follows. Whenever you incur into a cost, it means that you are paying for something and you are not spending that money in something else. Okay? So when we spend money in health, it means that we are not spending an extra amount of money, I mean, this is a bit crude, eh? in education. Okay? So whatever cost you always incur, there is an opportunity cost of not spending it elsewhere. Okay? So this is the idea of an opportunity cost of an opportunity cost. So when we talk about the social opportunity cost, means that when we are spending our monies in one intervention, okay, it means that we are not going to be spending it anywhere else. When we are paying like drug A for Alzheimer or drug A for cancer treatment, it means that we are not going to be putting that amount of money into any other treatment in any other condition. Okay? So it is important to actually use the discounting, um, use the discount rate, and um, bring the monies to the present. Okay? So we are always on the same page. We are always accounting for the present value of all the inflow of costs that you are going to have along your time horizon. <coughs> um, there are different, sorry, before I, I go to this. Um, I'm talking about money. What about health? And we mentioned this before slightly. Well, it's if you if. Well, this is reflected in the rate that you are going to be using. So. It tends to be the interest rate that you have out there, although you know, you know, you typically use very standard rates to actually bring, um, you know, the cost to the net present value. Um, but the social opportunity cost, if you know, you want to think about another way, is like the money that you are not spending today in health. Okay, you could put it in an account, in a bank account, that would give you a return. Yeah. Well, that's what the social opportunity means. It's like the money that we, the government. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you mean in practical terms. Like, if it's the money that you would gain if you had put your money investing, I don't know. But that's, I think, what social means. It's because we are spending money, public money. So it's in terms of the opportunity cost that, you know, the society will have of not spending the money in, 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 in an intervention or in health, but spending it somewhere else. That's what the social um, aspect refers to. Okay. What about health? What about the outcomes? What do we do? Shall we discount them? Shall we not discount them? No? We don't want discounting, and that's why we just like discount only on monies. What's going to happen? And I can give you the answer now. Can they are still talking about it. They they haven't made. Can you discount health? Exactly. Can you discount health? Do you think that health is tr something that you can trade? I'm gonna put it in another way. You can't trade a Kit Kat, right? You can trade I don't know a coffee or a bottle of water. It has a price, and you can exchange it. It's health something that you can trade? To an extent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To an extent. Yeah. Can you exchange? Can we exchange our health? Like, can we trade it? Are you willing to? I mean, it depends on how you're talking about the trade. Trade between who and what. So, 
Is it in general? Is health something that you can trade? No, no. no. not in that way. Not in <coughs> so, <coughs> are we? Hmm? Yeah, you can invest and produce it, of course. But your investment and my investment might be the same, but you get better health than me. Can I come and tell you, well, would you mind trading a little bit of your health? Like you give me 10% of yours and then... Yeah, that's what they do, because they do discount, but the idea, I mean, the debate comes from, you know, actually some people say health is not something that you can trade, and the same way that people have preferences for actually preferring money now instead of in the future, um, you know, this is not quite clear with health. It's not so clear cut, let's say, okay? These time preferences that are, you know, well established with money are not necessarily happening when, when we talk about health itself. Um, there, um, you know, there are, you know, some people that are against it, and some people, um, you know, in favor of discounting. And some other people as well say that if you already take, you know, a help, a, a time, pass so the quality, if you remember, was a combination of uh, utility weight and time, right? If you already take like the time, pass like the time. If you already account for time within the computation of a quality, why would you care about actually discounting it? D do you remember that is a combination of the two? You had this, uh, the quality was you, like utility weights times the, how long we, are, we were going to be on that. Um, so if a quality already has a time component incorporated into the definition itself, why would you actually decide to discount? Uh, quality in the first place, or an outcome in the first place. That's a matter of preference. Yeah, anything that you say, uh, you know, in favor or against, you know, it's still unresolved. So you can you can look at it from that, you know, point of view as well. So, but they like they do have guidelines and people do actually discount. Um, and I'm going to show you later on the table of the difference that it makes actually to discount benefits um, and and costs and depending on the rates that you use, it can make a huge difference in terms of incremental cost effectiveness ratio and you know, and how likely you are to get something below the threshold compared to not having it recommended at all. So the discounting factor does play a role. Now, if you decide to not to discount helps, what are you going to do in the sensitivity analysis? Test it. Test your model. Change your, you know, your discounting rates. Include discounting health, for instance, instead of, you know, not discounting it. Don't forget, whatever we talk about today, okay, in terms of time horizon, in terms of um, discounting and all these, these are things that you can later test. You can run a model thinking that five years is enough and then say, well, maybe I want to test whether in, in ten, like looking at the time horizon of 10 years is actually worth, um, you know, um, analyzing because it's going to prove that my intervention ends up having like a much better um, outcome than what initially was, what I was thinking. If I decide not to have, you know, um, health uh, outcomes discounted in your sensitivity analysis, discount it and see how your result will change. Or if you decide to go for a 3.5% discount rate instead of actually using a 6%, 6 then in your sensitivity analysis, test it. Go and test your model using a 6% discount rate. Okay? This is like the sensitivity analysis is going to be the part. I mean, you, you can do a lot of work in the computation of your incremental cost effectiveness ratio, but the sensitivity analysis is very important. It gives robustness to your model. And because there is going to be uncertainty in terms of the parameters that you are going to put in your model, 
it's very important to see whether your model is actually going to keep telling you the same story and it's going to be consistent um, in telling you, well, let's recommend it or not, let's not recommend it. Um, if after changing many of the parameters, you still get exactly the same, you know, the same decision, okay? So the part of sensitivity analysis is, uh, is a part that a lot of people kind of neglect or don't give enough importance and it's equally as important as setting up your decision model and come up with the answer. Okay, it's extremely important. Um, which discount function to use? Well, basically, they are going to use, do you want me to do a small example of how to discount costs so we are kind of all on the same page? I mean, it's very simple. Imagine that you are going to have like 100 pounds today or, I mean, let's keep it simple, okay? The, the cost that you are going to incur today is um, 100 pounds, next year it's 100 pounds, um, in two years time it's 100 pounds and in three years time it's 100 pounds, okay? How do you bring all these costs in these four years to today's value, okay? What cost do I have today, this year? Today, in field one, I have 100 pounds, okay? What happens next year? Next year I'm gonna have exactly the same cost, it's going to be 100 pounds. No. <laughs> you have to use this um, discount um, function okay. Okay. that basically what you're doing is to use the interest rate, okay? And your 100 pounds tomorrow, today, are worth one plus the interest rate. Uh, now it's very low. Well, it's 0 0.5, 0 0.05 to the power of one. This means one year that you bring to today, okay? Then, in the following year, you're going to have 100 pounds divided by 1 plus 0 0.05 to the power of 2, okay? In the fourth year, you're going to have 100 pounds, okay, divided by 1 plus 0 0.05 to the power of 3, okay? What we do here is exactly this. In the um, discounting formula that you have here is whatever cost you have, whatever money you have, divided by 1 plus the interest rate to the power of the number of periods that you are bringing, like, the monies uh, to, okay? But the interest rate changes a year, or assuming the same for discount. No, it's... I mean, in exercises, when you are looking, I mean, in investment, so in financial um, decisions, in investment, for instance, the, the interest rate does change. You know, our savings accounts now don't see so, mu so many savings because the interest rates are very low. But when it comes to discounting, you will see that the economic evaluation models typically use what NICE recommends, is a 3.5%, okay? But what matters is that you are bringing this cost into the, you know, into the net present value. This is the net present value, okay? And then you have to use this formula. So if I was doing this, the R would be 3.5 yeah. for, for all three. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they keep it constant, okay. yeah? And uh, they do exactly the same for outcomes. They also discount the outcomes at 3.5, okay? If your intervention is actually only having effects over a year, are you going to discount? Louder? No. If you are looking at an intervention that only has effects this year, you don't have to discount anything. Okay? It's when you have like health outcomes and costs that are going to be happening in the future. Okay? Now, these hyperbolic models that you have here is because there are some people that say that people have strong preferences for, you know, um, today's kind of, to f for having today money, um, much more than what the um, exponential function has. This is our, you know, this is actually the time, the timeline and the interest rates. So, um, you know, this is how much we discount if we follow the exponential function. And some people say that people have stro much stronger preferences um, in terms of having like money like today, right now. So in a way that monies in the future 
are discounted at a much higher, you know, at a much higher level. Okay, but you know, don't worry very much. This is what it's used. It's the discount function that is, you know, commonly used, not only in health, but many others anyway. It's more on an academic grounds. They, they use this hyperbolic discount function. Um, so, which discount rate? Um, interestingly, there has been a shift. Okay, uh, in some cases. Um, so, I think Nice actually moved. Um, I think it moved. Now it's discounting the 3.5 percent for costs and, and effects. And I believe before they were discounting the health effects at 6 percent, but they put like then decided to actually put it all together at 3.5 percent. Okay, um, the WHO follows a 3 percent. Um, and in general, as I was saying before, whatever rate you use, and you will see it quite often, how in the sensitivity analysis part they actually change the rates to see um, the robustness of the model. Now, these guys did a study on the discounting for health effects and cost benefit and cost effectiveness analysis, um, and they found like a very mixed approach to how the each of the studies um, were done. So they um, came up with a figure that says that about 28% of the studies did not discount costs and benefits. Okay? You can argue, I would say that you can argue about not discounting outcomes, about not discounting the benefits, but not discounting the costs, it's a bit like not quite right. Okay? The costs, I think they should be discounted um, because economically it, it makes sense. Okay, it's, it's logical. The health, as, um, the health outcomes, as we have said, you know, some people might say yes, some people might say no. Um, and so if you look at the outcome, like mortality, I would say two lives in five years. How can they discount this? Well, in terms of, um, of the effect, probably you can decide not to go for it. Yeah, no, I would like to discount it. You want <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, if you want to discount, if you want to discount it, do it, go for it, yeah, and then tell me what well, you just discount, you just apply the formula. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no. well, if my outcome is mortality, I would say two lives. Well, some uh, exactly like money is in you know you have a m unit of measurement like uh, it's money, but the same as life years or the number of lives that you save or qualities that you gain. These are not natural, you know, monetary values. So again, this is why some people say, well, let's not discount it. There is always a monetary term because you always look at the cost of it. Yeah, you said how, how does he calculate the cost of those two lives? Two lives yeah. So you put a monetary value to the cost. Yeah. Well, I don't know when oh. it will happen. But you have to have five years, I would say two lives. So and how much money are you incurring over? Like you're going to be spending some money today okay. in saving those two lives. Next year, I don't know, eh? Next year, in two years' time. <laughs> okay? And after those two years, you've saved X amount of lives. Okay. Then the costs are clear. Yeah, the costs are important. Are you clear about the outcomes? Do you like the idea of discounting? No, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not going to give you a recipe. I'm saying so some people uh, go about. So I would say. Do you calculate the. It's, it's Martin's question, I think, is how do you calculate the cost of the outcome? The money, in the, like the amount of money, because you well. have to put it into same units, no? No, and that's why some people argue that, you know, it's not money, so why would you discount it? It's number of years that you. a uh, number of lives that you will save. But if you were to discount it, you have to convert it to money. No. The outcome will be measured in money, and this is the part that we didn't cover yesterday. Yeah, um, when you are actually attributing like money to a life, to a statistical life, or you are expressing some willingness to pay. Okay, in this case, it's money. Okay, in the other cases, you are not dealing with money in terms of the outcomes. Yes. Do you like the idea of discounting? Yes, go for it. No. Let's start with the no, not discounting, and then in the sensitivity analysis, discount it. Yeah. 
Not because they use discount is... No, not because they discount it, it means that they are attaching a ma a money to the quality. Eh? It keeps, it's still, uh, it's still a quality. It's just that it's discounted. Okay? But it's not, what I, what I mean by discounting it is not that NICE tells you to actually attach a monetary value to the quality and then discount it. The monetary side is always and clear cut on the cost side. On what, what's, which are the costs that you incur in, you know, in running something or having an intervention? I understand the discounting way. So this, if I say two, two lives, so I'm saying one life is one million euros, and this happens at two, at two in the year four. So I one, let's say, one life in year and next year, and yeah. one life in two years' time. So I would discount this two million to the net present value. Yeah. So I have to compare, so I put a number or a money into one life in order to discount it. So no. what you're saying is at the end of the day, if he discounts the cost of providing the care, for instance, he's not going to be able to get the outcome of two patients by the next year if he discounts. So if he discounts that cost from one million to maybe at in year two, he's having to spend, if I'm being happy, 800,000. The 800,000 may not give him two patients' lives. Is that what you're no, saying? No, I'm not discounting the cost. I just want to discount my outcome. <laughs> discounted using you the formula. Right. There is no... Yeah. There is nothing. There is nothing tricky about it. The discounting is made using the formula. Discounting costs is clear cut because it's money. Discounting helps is more like of a controversy because some people agree, some people don't. Use the formula. That's it. Use the quality. Use the measure of outcome and discount it. You don't have to, no, 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 you don't have to, you don't have to give like the monetary value. The measure of outcome is the measure of outcome. The only time that it's measurable in terms of money is when we use the cost uh, benefit analysis that we didn't cover. The other two ways that we looked at, it was qualies and natural units, like you, you're talking about life, life saves, right? Um, these don't have money, yeah? And I don't know whether maybe the confusion comes from the fact that we talk about money on the cost side but not on the outcome side and therefore it, l it seems a bit weird to actually discount something that is not mo on monetary value. You know, it's perfectly fine. Uh, so yeah. If you follow the guidelines from NICE, if you decide to go for another... I mean, they pretty much use standard rates. Okay, it's, it's pretty much standard the type of rate that they use. NICE says 3.5 for each, but what you will see as well is that in the sensitivity analysis, they actually change the rate to see whether having like a higher discounting rate or a lower discounting rate will, will actually influence your, um, your result. Does this answer the question? The same way that the threshold is 20,000, 30,000, and there is no empirical evidence upon which NICE decided to set up that threshold, in these cases is 3.5%. It tends to, okay, I don't think that they have a formula by which, you know, they came up with this number. It tends to reflect, again, preferences for, you know, preferences in terms of bringing outcomes, health outcomes or costs into the, into the present. Okay. Um, anyway, so in this, in this study, if you, just in case you have the reference there um, and you want to have a look at it, um, almost all of them that were actually using discount rates use exactly the same one for the health and um, costs. 
the more frequently rates were 3% and 5% and only in the UK. Um, I, I, I say it the other way around actually. In the UK actually, the, uh, the official guidance was to discount 6% on costs and I think that was 3.5 in effect. I want to check if this is according to what the study says. But then, you know, they moved to actually having a 3.5% in, um, in both sides, basically. Um, it does make a difference which discount rate you use because if you look at, you know, you have two papers in these two references, they actually have a discussion on, you know, the importance of um, discounting. And then they provide some studies in which actually you can look at how equal discounting is affecting um, your cost effectiveness as compared to using differential discounting. In this case, um, differential discounting refers to 6% for money and 1.5% for health. Okay? Um, so in cases like this one, okay, um, uh, for a meni meningococcal vaccine, okay, if you use equal discounting, you get this, um, you know, cost effectiveness ratio compared to that much. The difference is huge. Here you have 15,000 and here you have almost 4,000. So the implications of actually using a different discount rate can be quite, you know, significant in terms of the magnitude. Other studies, for instance, this one in terms of blood pressure control in type 2 diabetes, the same. The differences are quite, you know, quite important. You could argue that here maybe it doesn't make that much difference, but in the other cases, is you know, differences are are quite important. Yeah. Seems like the discount or effect would actually undermine the cell from the perspective of someone trying to get a because what you're in effect saying is that this product is good for whatever. It's going to be progressively worth less as time goes on than the second one. So it seems to me nobody would. Uh, can you? Th eh? Can you? I was going to ask. Can you think about a case in which discounting health effect is important? I mean, related to to the point that you are raising. No, I can't. But I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm asking you. Can you think of uh, an intervention <laughs> in which the effect, for instance? I'll say that, for example, um, immunosent. At this point, you're only considering, you know, whatever you have at hand. So what's coming in the market later, you don't account it. But So what is an ICD? Uh, sorry, implantable defibrillator. Yeah. So you're going to save lives, and you're going to save lives, some in the first year, some in the second year, some in the eighth year. It would make sense, surely, if you're looking cost-effectiveness, to say the life I saved six months after I put the device in, or the life I prolonged, if you like, there is greater gain than the one that might go off eight years down the line. say when when are these lives going to be saved and the life you save next week is you've got a greater gain than the life you save eight years down the line. Huh? It really depends. You don't have to but it, it really depends on the when the an example where this yeah. would make some I was going to give you the example of prevention for instance. It does make a difference when the realization of the improvements of the health outcomes are going to happen. Okay? In terms of prevention Okay, think about any policy that prevents something, I don't know, vaccines or whatever. Uh, the realization of the benefits 
is not happening today, right? It's happening in the future. If you are actually, um, you know, what's the difference between discounting or not discounting this? If you discount those effects, what's going to happen? Because those effects happen more in the future, you are likely to get a number that tells you that your intervention is kind of less effective. then it might look more effective, no? Okay, yeah, if you want to try. Sorry for the interruption. So it's the, I mean, whether you decide to account for, for discounting or not, and when, you know, the effects, the health effects are going to be realized, it, it can make your, you know, analysis look less cost effective. You might find some people, they will say, well, nice recommends the 3.5, I'm using this. But again, in the sensitivity analysis, they will test it. Okay, so it's not that, sorry. It's not that they just leave it there. They, this is something that if you're not happy with, go and test it. Okay? Um, go and actually change the numbers and see what you get. Okay? Uh, okay, let's get into actually doing some, um, you know, uh, modeling. Okay? I'm going to tell you a little bit about decision trees and Markov models. Okay? I think decision trees are quite a neat way to uh, present um, an, a scenario of an intervention in which costs and outcomes are going to happen most likely as a one-off, okay? Um, eh, and if you have to compare decision trees with Markov models, okay, the Markov models are going to be more suitable when you have um, a case of an intervention in which it has a longer time horizon and there is some uncertainty about, um, you know, the pathway that a patient may have. Okay? Um, in a way, if you want to start thinking about Markov models, you can think about cancer again. In cancer, when you are assessing different interventions, you might say, well, my patients start well with, you know, cancer-free, but some of them actually move to, uh, no, sorry, no, not uh, cancer-free, sorry, they might start with some sort of cancer, but after treatment, they, f they feel well, but then they can be you know, recurring into a cancer or dying. So you have different states uh, between which patients can jump, okay? Um, so Markov models tend to actually accommodate models that include some uncertainty in which of the states the individual, is, the patient is going to be, and also they tend to look at a much longer, you know, horizon. They do account for a specific number of years. Decision trees are kind of a snapshot. This is what we are looking at. These are the two interventions that we are comparing. This is the pathway, like in terms of how likely it is that you follow this pathway or another one. And then we compare um, costs and outcomes, okay? Now, um, before we move on to actually um, do um, some um, decision trees, I'm gonna be actually illustrating the decision tree with an example, okay? And I'm gonna just, uh, well, I'll tell you later. Um, why are you going to be um, doing modeling in the first place? Okay, and this is something that I've, I've mentioned before. Um, when you are comparing interventions, okay, the, it's most likely the case that somebody has run a randomized control trial or a trial in which the interventions or the new, the new intervention was being compared to another intervention. Okay? Um, however, clinical trials are not you know, perfect, and they are not problem free, problem free, sorry, in terms of actually um, providing the required data that you might need in your model, okay? They have, they recruit patients, they randomize, and uh, they have control treatments, uh, uh, control groups, sorry, treatment groups. Um, they sometimes don't cover the full um, set of options um, that are comparable, so maybe they just compare two different drugs, 
but there are other drugs in the market that could be compared with, but that specific randomized control trial doesn't count with. They only follow up patients for two years when, you know, um, ideally you would like to see what's happening, you know, after those two years. Um, and they have other problems that make that, although clinical trials are always a good, you know, a good source of information to begin with, they are not perfect. So you will need to rely on information on clinical trials. You will need to rely on uh, data that will come from a literature review, okay? You will learn next week. You will do, a, um, you know, a whole week on um, doing, you know, systematic literature review. From those uh, results that you get from the literature review, you will be able to learn ab about other inputs, other information that you need from your model, okay? And um, you have to kind of put together the information that you have in the clinical trial with information that you have um, obtained from published um, papers. And in case you don't find information in published papers, you can rely on clinical expertise. Um, and then you have to put together all this data in the model that you have specified in order to know whether the interpretation is cost effective or not. Okay? So you will be building a model, okay? you will be saying, these are the interventions I want to compare. This is my, my comparator, this is the, how I describe the, you know, the routine practice, and then I need this and this and this set of information. Part of it will come from the clinical trial, part of it will come from um, literature review, and in some cases, you will have to rely on clinical expert expertise. Don't worry if whenever you're doing um, modeling, there is one parameter you cannot get the number for. Okay, there is a probability, there is an outcome. You have no idea where you can get this information from. If you rely on clinical expertise, it's perfectly fine. What are you going to do to actually, you know, Make sure, exactly, if, if there is uncertainty about a specific parameter in your model, okay, and according to clinical expertise, you decide to put, to plug in into your model a specific number, in the sensitivity analysis, you can actually test this again, okay? So I hope by the end of today, you are convinced that sensitivity analysis is very important, but because there is a lot of uncertainty in terms of the numbers that we plug in into our model, it's really important that you actually test your model, actually changing, you know, the values of the parameters that you use in your model, okay? Now, how are we going to set up a model, okay? And um, how are we going to actually understand what the decision tree is helping us with and what type of um, situations, scenarios it can um, capture, okay? We are, I'm going to be using an example of uh, a study that was run um, in 2002 for uh, postnatal depression in a high-risk um, cohort of uh, women that were actually screened in uh, Reading here in the UK, okay? And it was uh, comparing prenatal treatment for people with a high risk of uh, postnatal depression versus just having postnatal treatment, okay? Um, but the basic steps whenever you are going to be, you know, uh, building um, a decision tree is the following, okay? Structure the problem by constructing a mathematical model of decision making as a series of connected events, okay? You need to start from somewhere, and this somewhere means what are the options that we have. In the case that we are going to be looking at is to have the postnatal screening, well, sorry, the prenatal, you know, treatment versus not having anything. And from here, what we do is to follow the pathway that the pathway of treatment that you will see um, for the cohort of patients, okay? You will, ha you, will, sorry. <coughs> you will have to quantify uncertainty by given probabilities to those uh, parts of the tree in which there is an, an element of chance, okay? Um, in some cases, when you, um, you know, when you have a number of, uh, you, you have two alternatives and you compare them, okay, for each com comparison group, you will have elements of chance that tell you how likely they are to actually develop whatever condition, or how likely they are to be treated and actually have a successful outcome, okay? So you will need to actually account for, um, you know, this aspect of, um, of chance that, um, defines a decision tree. 
You will also have to quantify the preferences by giving values to the possible outcomes. Okay? At the end of the decision tree, you will have a number of costs that you are incur incurring into, and then also a number of outcomes that you know um, you are gaining or or losing. Okay? You will have to combine uncertainty and preferences to actually give a decision. And then you can do sensitivity analysis, um, changing assumptions one to three to see the impact on your decision. Okay? So that sounds really you know, abstract, probably. So let's look at uh, what the decision tree looks um, in, um, in with this specific example that I was telling you. Okay? So you start... This was a study that was um, actually, I think it was recruiting women like in this town in, uh, in England, in Reading, and they were actually, um, I think it was women pregnant between week 26 and 28, and they were actually given a test to actually identify those that were at high risk of post postnatal depression. Okay? I think there is a score in which you, know, you can I identify those ones. And, um, and then um, of those that, high, that had a high risk, then um, some of them were actually randomized to actually receive prenatal treatment, and some of them actually were randomized to actually not having any prenatal treatment whatsoever. Okay? So what you have here is that you have the two groups, the group of women for which they, they receive like prenatal treatment, and those for which there was nothing happening, okay? Um, for those with prenatal treatment, then um, they, uh, they actually had a number of um, two branches, okay, um, that actually define for how many of them or what was the likelihood that then some of them had postnatal depression and some of them had no postnatal depression, okay? For the do-nothing, they follow the same approach, postnatal depression and non-postnatal depression. Because they were interested in the costing side okay, um, of uh, postnatal, well, on, of the prenatal treatment and the consequences in terms of costs of having this prenatal treatment um, for future um, uh, depression, postnatal depression. Um, they were actually um, assigning those with postnatal depression treatment and no treatment. And then you could actually see whether they, they um, were going through the postnatal depression or non-postnatal depression at all. Okay? I think what they were assuming here is that they had like a more clear-cut path of costing um, as compared to the do-nothing option. Okay? So in a way, the do-nothing um, was uh, uh, accounting for a, for a much wider kind of... Um, uh, number of costs that were identified at much different stages. Yeah? But what, so the model, they, if you get, having done nothing, and you get postnatal depression, you may then get treatment. Yeah. But if you have had prenatal treatment and you get postnatal depression, why isn't that treatment built into that? I think the way that they assumed it was because um, the what I'm going to show you later is just like some figures of the costs that were associated to each branch. And basically, um, in the prenatal treatment branch, um, because in a way they were avoiding cases, so the, the number of costs that they were incurring were going to be much lower. Whereas here they were more interested in highlighting the path of doing nothing and the different options that you could have in developing versus not developing um, postnatal depression. Can we focus? Can we? Yeah, there are many. If you don't like this example, I take it. I take your point. <laughs> in, no, no. Maybe it's not actually 
I might think about that actually. If you don't like this example, can we stick to actually how a decision tree works? Because you will have many more in the, in the recommended readings, you will have many more examples, and I'm more interested in you understanding, um, you know, how the decision tree works rather than in whether this makes sense or not, okay? Actually, we will see the, uh, well, the textbooks for sure you will have examples, okay? And they are quite good. Maybe this one is not as good, I take it. Uh, but is, I just want to illustrate how the decision tree works, okay? These are probabilities, I was going to go there, okay? Here, this is a decision node. Some of them will be treated, so some of them will have this prenatal treatment, some others will, will not, okay? Now, when it comes to prenatal treatment, some of them actually will have postnatal depression and some others will not. So in here, you have some chance arising, okay? There are some probabilities attached to each of these branches and the same for all of the branches here. Okay, so there are going to be pro probabilities that are going to be attached to each of to each of them. And something else. Yeah. 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 They can get as complex as you want. Eh? This is meant again. This is meant to reflect routine practice and how you know the interventions compete with each other or what the options you have. So in this case, it's just like two branches in the decision node, but if you want more, you can add more. It can get really complicated, okay? Um, so we are going to have at probabilities attached to each of the branches. For those with the prenatal treatment, 15% um, um, developed postnatal depression and 85% had no postnatal depression. And then if you look at them do nothing, here you have the probabilities attached as well. The same way that for those that had postnatal depression in the do-nothing branch, then half of them were assigned to treatment, half of them not to treatment, and then you have here the probabilities attached to actually developing further postnatal depression, okay? So whenever you see the probabilities, okay, it's because there are, you know, um, you know chances, and an element of chance that actually take, you know, uh, tells you um, that this outcome happens with this probability and this outcome happens with this other probability. When you are looking at the branches here, okay, the two events that you have in each branch, they are mutually exclusive. It's either one or the other one. It doesn't happen that a woman has half postnatal depression and half non-postnatal depression. You either have it or you don't have it, okay? So that they are mutually exclusive. And what you are going to need here in order to compare you know, health and outcomes is at the end of each branch, you need to know how many costs, like how much was per, in terms of costs incurred in each of the branches and which are the outcomes that come at the end of each branch as well, okay? So what you should see now is basically a, a number here that tells you, well, for each of these, you know, endpoints, I have so much cost and so many um, qualities or, you know, other measures of outcome, okay? On purpose, I'm going just to talk about costs now because in the practical session, I'm gonna add the outcome bit, okay? I'm gonna ask you to actually complete this decision tree with some information on utilities and then we are going to actually <laughs> compute what's, what's happening in this model, okay? So, they are quantifying, you know, the cost in each branch and they tell you, you know, if a woman follows this pathway, ends up have, like incurring in a cost of 3,200, okay? If she is going through that pathway, this is how much it costs. And the same for all the others, okay? So you can see how, um, you know, the decision tree follows with the elements of chance given by the probabilities of being in each of the other branches, and then at the end, you have all of the outcomes, uh, of the um, monetary outcomes, okay? Now, would you, yeah? No, this is the cost of treatment, I would say. Sorry, I, I can't see you. 
No, it's along. You mean the very last one? Oh, 300. 300, probably because. I don't, I don't know. So. Postnatal depression, no treatment. <laughs> so there's and a cost no. to society of her being depressed, even if you don't treat her. I don't really know whether this is a cost to society. It's probably. Maybe because she's not treated, you know, she's not, you know, specifically treated by, you know, for depression, but, you know, she does consume some GP practices, yeah. She goes to the GP and maybe, you know, there is some consumption, some sort of use of resources for the NHS. Yeah? Uh, um, what about, sorry, what about now combining the information on the costs and the probabilities, okay? How are you going to, eventually what we want to say is whether this is better than this, right? So how are we going to work out in terms of costs whether one is costing more than the other? For instance, in the prenatal treatment with 15%, they have, they are treated, they have, sorry, postnatal depression and they have this cost with 85% this much. Yeah. What's the expected value? Yeah, okay. So you will have the, proba the expected value is going to be the probability of not having, you know, of having postnatal depression times the cost of having postnatal depression plus the probability of not having postnatal depression times the cost of not having postnatal depression. Postnatal depression. Okay? Is the expected cost. Okay? Um, so, in this case, it's 0 0.15, and I'm going to show it to you here in the whiteboard, slightly different to what you will see there. Okay? This is 0 0.15. By the way, what is the relationship, to the relationship between those two probabilities? Always make sure that your probabilities add up to one, okay? Because these are mutually exclusive and exhaustive events, okay? This one will be one minus this one, and the other way around, okay? So it's 0 0.15 times this plus 0 0.85 times this, okay? And this will give you something, and I don't have the number, but it will, it will give you an amount, okay? And this is the expected value. Now I'm saying that I don't have it because the way that this is presented here is that they actually compute, you know, this one times this one. How oh, is this one? It's, I thought that this is not. It's uh, 1,670 actually. Okay? What you have here is the cost, the probability of reaching the end of this branch, and then computing, you know, multiplying the probability times the cost. This is the result of multiplying the probability times the cost, and then you sum them up, and you have the expected cost of actually having, you know, a screening for, uh, well, the prenatal treatment, okay? The same one, the same, um, you know, idea follows in the following, in the next branch. It's a bit more complicated, okay? Because you can either start from the back and compute, you know, compute it that way, or you can actually say, well, how am I reaching here? How am I ending up in this point? I first have to come here, and then here, and then here. So which are the probabilities that are associated to ending up in this, um, at this point? 0, 4, times 0, 5, times 0, 2, okay? And if you end up here, you are 0, 4. With probability 0, 4, you end up in this branch, then 0, 5, then 0, 8. For here, 0, 4, 0, 5, 0, 8. For here, 0, 4, 0, 5, 0, 2. And for here, it's just 0, 6. Okay? So you have to kind of fall back the tree and start from the back and start accounting for the cost and the probabilities attached to actually ending up in that specific, um, you know, at that specific point. Okay? Any questions? Yeah? In, in this one, you mean? Yeah. 
Yeah, what would happen? I would have uh, I would have thought that they account for how much it uh, costs to actually have that yeah. list. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So the problem it costs fourteen hundred to do prenatal treatment. Yeah. Are you giving me a number that is here, or are you making yes, it up? It's there. No, this is the cost of actually having somebody that is treated prenatal. Yes. Okay. And Would then. You then get so that must be the cost of the treatment. Probably, probably, yeah, 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 yeah. So the difference there is 1,800. If you've got postnatal depression, it costs another 1,800. Yeah. But I mean, assuming that what he says is right, then, okay, yeah. But I'm these assumptions. But the odd thing is, when you get postnatal depression uh, in the lower branch, it seems to cost more than 1,800. Because they have been... Probably the severity. You have to account for severity issues here. I mean, this yeah, is yeah. a very much simplified case, sure. but it really depends on the severity of the depression. If you have maybe very mild depression, the costs that you incur are much lower than yeah. if you have a very severe one. So I would assume that it depends on, on these type of factors. Please don't take this as a true and very good representation, okay? Just take it as, you know, a description of what the decision tree looks like, okay? Added, like, yeah, I mean, the final figure that you have is because you've done an exercise of identifying the, the costs associated in each of the scenarios. So beforehand, you actually identify that for those women with prenatal treatment that end up having postnatal depression, there is the cost of the prenatal treatment plus the cost of treating them when they have the depression, okay? So these costs are like a, a, a sum of all the costs that, you know, actually... Um, you know, these people end up um, uh, having. Okay? Yep, yeah, yeah. By the probability, by the corresponding probability of ending up here. And the cost is actually the sum of, well, I do nothing before they give birth, no cost. Plus, what happens with these people? How many resources they consume in case they do have postnatal depression? Plus, what, what's the cost of this treatment? Plus, what happens here? Okay? Now I'm re realizing that probably this is not a good example. Okay. Anyway. Um, but, yeah, the cost that you, go, that you see there is just like the sum of all the costs that you see along, you know, along the, the, if you want to call it, the treatment pathway, in a way. Um, then, in the same way, you can also compute the expected costs that, you know, you would see if you come through the do-nothing um, option. Few things. Can you say something here about whether you would recommend the... Uh, not yet. Good. We lack one element, and we will work on it in the practical session, okay? We need to know what are the effects and then, you know, decide whether it's worth investing in the prenatal treatment or not. Something else, over which period of time are we, you know, constructing our modeling? It's just a, it's a few weeks, so it's less than a year. Okay, so you can see that the progression, yeah, like the progression is actually within a kind of set uh, framework. Okay? So we don't need to understand. No. Good. Yeah. Because you have like an intervention, you're looking at an intervention that simply happens within a year. You, there is no need for discounting, um, among other things. Also? Yeah? Um, any questions about the decision trees? Always think that whenever there is a probability is because there are chances attached to being in each of the branches, okay? If you have a prenatal treatment, there is a chance that you will develop depression and there is a chance that you will not have any depression, okay? So in those cases, when there are probabilities attached, always make sure that they sum up to one 
and that these are, you know, um, events that are mutually exclusive. What kind of perspective would you also uh, I think it's only NHS, like only health, I think. Oh, I'm probably sure. Well, probably. I mean, you could think about some like the getter, if you know, if somebody needs to look after the the woman that is having postnatal depression. Maybe this is the type of course that you could think of as including extra, but I think it's exclusively on the on the health cost side. Yeah. What next? Okay, we, I haven't given you the full picture because, as I said, we, have, we still have to give some measures of the outcomes that we achieve in each, um, in each branch, but in each, you know, endpoint. But where do we get the information about, you know, this 15% or 85%? Where is this information coming from? Uh, Petro et al. most likely went and did, you know, systematic literature review. They got information and they came up with these numbers. Or not, I don't really know how they came up with these numbers. But I would have assumed that that was a reasonable way to actually know how many women end up having postnatal depression after, you know, having prenatal treatment. Mm -hmm. Are yeah, you? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. In this case, yeah. Or if he was, he was, I think he was running his, his own, he was the one running the, the kind of, yeah. So he probably had it, you know, first hand. That doesn't mean that this is exempt of uncertainty and that you might still do some sensitivity analysis and change how the expected cost will change when the probability instead of being 15% is 20%. What you can do, for instance, when you are actually after these probabilities is go to the literature, find some studies, um, synthesize, you know, the information in a meta-analysis, use the information from the meta-analysis, and then use a, a range type, like the lower bound or the upper bound of a confidence interval or things like this, the mean, the median, okay? And use it in your sensitivity analysis, okay? But it's, it is really important. Right, what do you think, um, you know, these type of approaches lack. I like them because they are very neat, okay? They just capture a snapshot of how practice is. This might not be very accurate, uh, but in general, the decision tree is like a snapshot of the pathway that, you know, some patients might follow along the tree, okay? And it's supposed to be representative of what's happening in, in, rea in the real world. But can you think about circumstances in which a decision tree like that cannot be actually good for actually modeling? This is actually what happened here. It's, and it's actually a, a good point. What happens in the decision tree is that everybody follows a very standard pathway, okay? If you are treated prenatally, then you may have or you may not have um, depression afterwards. Or you are in the do-nothing one, okay? But you don't end up here and then move to this state. Or you don't end up here and then you move here, okay? The definition of the pathway is very well defined. I'm pretty sure that you can tell me about, you know, some sort of condition for which you can see how individuals might move from one state, as they call it in the Markov models, to another one. But you, if you come through the do nothing, you remain in the do nothing. So. But once, let's say, because this starts at week 26 before giving birth, and I think it finishes afterward, like after you know a few weeks after giving birth. Okay, I think they were checking 
eight weeks, 18 weeks, and something else. If I am an expectant mother, and I'm here, in the do nothing, and then I don't have any postnatal depression, I end up here. There is no way, no way, that I can jump here. Because the definition of the pathways is very clear. Like, you follow, you know, you follow your way according to whether you have been, you know, treated beforehand or not. And then depends on whether you develop uh, postnatal depression or not. I'm thinking about cases in which as a patient, you might start, you know, kind of having events that make that, and I don't really mean that you should have, or you should think in terms of decision trees, like, um, think about the scenarios in which you can actually have movements through different health states when you are looking at an intervention. So, you so for have uh, issues of hypertension, so you don't... You don't have hypertension now, and you're in that kind of nothing group, but three years later you mm -hmm. develop. So you, this model is kind of too simplistic for what happens sometimes in, in real life. First of all, you've given me a time dimension. Yeah. And second, you've given me a description of how individuals can jump from one state to the other one. Um, then, following your example, can somebody with hypertension then not be hyper, hy, not have hypertension and then go back to being ba uh, good again. Die. Or they can die, <laughs> yes. No, quite rightly because a lot of Markov models actually assume that the death yeah. exists, okay? So the example that he has given is basically considering people that, so for instance, let's assume that we are the cohort of patients, right? And we start, um, some of us start being hypertensive, some others not. But next period, because we are very good, we take drugs, we whatever, we actually follow a good lifestyle, we manage to, in the next period, some of us reduce our levels, okay? But the very next year, we end up having, again, problems of hypertension. You are looking at the model in which you are allowing transitions between different states along a time horizon. Because as a patient, I might not always be in the healthy state and not having hypertension. Okay, so this is what, you know, the type of Markov models actually try to capture, okay? These are models that um, are very useful when events can repeat, can, can occur many times over time, or when patients move through a series of health states over time, okay? Another example, again, going back to the cancer um, uh, example, I, these are patients for which they might be treated for cancer, some of them might stay well for the rest of their life. Some of them might just have a recurrence the following year and then stay well. Some of them might rec have a re another recurrence and so on and so forth. So these are models that are going to allow individuals to move, you know, through different, um, or to actually allow transitions between different health states, okay? So Markov models are going to be made up of a series of mutually exclusive and exhaustive health states. Again, what does this mean? We were talking about the hypertension case. You either don't have hypertension, or you do have hypertension, or you are dead. Okay? So, you are in either, or, or in either one or the other or the third one, but you cannot be half dead, half hypertensive. Okay? So, these are mutually exclusive and exhaustive events. And the number of states will depend on how many, you know, there are, which differ in terms of the value and resource use, and might be um, also influenced by data availability, okay? So, you know, how your Markov model will be, it really depends on the kind of intervention that you are um, having at hand and how you are going to model it. Basically, what you will see is that a Markov model is represented as such, okay? You have kind of circles that show whether you are well, you are hyper you have hypertension, okay, or you die. Now, I'm allowing transitions between all of those states, from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, from here to here. From here to here, from here to here, from here to here. 
I didn't catch you. <laughs> What's wrong with this? I mean, the representation is par, partly all right, but there is something that is not. What happens with the dead state? It's the end. Okay? It's what they call, in terms of uh, ter terminology, an absorbing state. Once you absorbing state, once you end up in that state, there is no way back. You finish there. <laughs> yeah? So, that's it. I also, you might also allow for hypertension to go here. The arrows that go to the same state is because the individual the following year is in the same state. Okay? So some people are well today, they are going to be well tomorrow. Some people of these will go to hypertensive and, and uh, then the following year some of the hypertensive will stay there or some of them will transition to being well. Okay? So this is kind of um, the idea. Yeah? Any questions? What is going to change here? Let's say in the, first, in the first period, you're going to have what they are called transition probabilities. Okay? Because before, you will have to define the number of intervals, or what they call a, um, cycles, that patients will be moving, or staying, it really depends, uh, between health states. So tell me a time horizon for this model. How long do you think that this is worth following? I don't know. Let's assume that you want hypertension, like to control hypertension for those that are 65 and above, or 75 and above. I don't know, I'm just making it up if it makes any sense. I don't know. Um, let's say uh, we want to follow, if the life expectancy is whatever, you just follow them up for 15 more years and then you just see how they progress. Okay? What happens now is that the transition probabilities will tell you how individuals move across states. Okay? So, do I... Okay, yeah, I have an example, but I can, I can tell you now. In the first state, in the first period, okay, we might either start with all of the, all of the individuals being well, so you get a cohort of patients and then all of them are going to be well. And then you see how many of them remain well, how many of them go to becoming hypertensive and how many of them die. Okay, so you start with a very neat model in which everybody starts from the same level. So not having anything, any problem. Then you need to, uh, in the following period, some of them will actually remain in the same period, in the same state. So let's say, let me see what I have. This is the starting point, okay? So you are either well, sick, or dead, okay? So we start from here. And then we look at probabilities to the state of remaining well, uh, being sick and having hypertension or dying, okay? So this is our starting point and this is our end point. Okay? So all our individuals start here. So all of them are actually well. In the power low wind period, of those that were well, 80% remain well. And 0 0.2 <coughs> actually become hypertensive. And none of them actually die. Or I could decide that this is 0 0.1 and 0 0.1 or any other combination. It doesn't matter. Always check that the probability sum up to one. If in the second period, because we have assumed that all of the individuals were starting, you know, at the point in which they were all healthy, this doesn't happen, okay? But, uh, sorry, let me just make a point. It's not a zero one, it's not from, from this to here, okay? It's where you are, and where you're moving, yeah. Okay, but I don't want to put zero one because you will think about, you know, period, uh, time, the time period zero compared to the following one, okay? If you are well, if, uh, if you have hypertension, 
how likely it is that you are going to be, you know, become well again without having any hypertension no, further? Okay. How likely it is that you remain in the same state? 60%? How likely you are? By, by default, this is it. This is 0 0.3. Okay? If you are dead, you're dead. That's it. There's nothing that you can do. Okay? You remain in that state. Okay? So there is no transition from dead to, um, to actually being well or dead to being, um, you know, uh, hy to having hypertensive problems and the probability is one. So you are in that and then you will remain there. So this is a more flexible model, I guess, than the distribution yeah. tree, but it also means that you then need to do more complex sensitivity analysis because if you change All the probabilities, yeah. probabilities yep. then... Yep. A problem that these uh, models have, and it's called something like the Markovian assumption, is that the assumption is that the probabilities, okay, uh, no, sorry, that in a way the process is memoryless. And this might not be clear in this example, but I'll give you another example later on. What happens in the past does not determine where you're going to end up. This model does not account for the fact that maybe if you were hypertensive the previous period, you are more likely to be hypertensive in the following period. Okay? For instance, um, if you are, uh, if instead of this example, you take the case of cancer, okay, in which you might have a model that actually says um, this is well in the sense that after treatment they don't have any recurrence. Here there is a recurrence, and here there is death. Okay, uh, in this case. Does it matter what happened before? Does it matter that you are having a recurrent event and how many events in the past? Does it matter? Yeah. You would say that yes, it matters. So if in the previous period you had a recurrence, maybe this increases your chances of actually having a recurrence in the future. Okay? So this is a limitation of the Markov model because it actually doesn't account for what has happened before. That, that doesn't mean that you cannot change the transition probabilities, okay? The transition probabilities can be changed because if you, for instance, think that as you progress in your model, like there are chances of dying, you can use life tables to adjust your probabilities and to actually make them decrease over time, okay? So the transition probabilities can be adjusted um, in a way. It's just like saying that you cannot mm, kind of account for what has happened in the past, okay? In the third cycle, one individual might be in the recurrent state and the probability attached on, um, for being in that recurrent state is going to be, I don't know, 0 0.5, 0 0.7. And this probability is not actually saying anything of where you were the previous period or two, previ two periods before. Okay? And this is one of the important um, limitations. Some of them can be overcome using slightly different models, survival, survival models. Hard to work. Um, so, exactly the same as with the decision tree, you have to compute the costs and, um, and the consequences, and then um, you use this black box called Excel or Triage Pro, and then, in a way, um, when you insert the cost and the, and the consequence, the outcome, whatever outcome measure that you will end up using, it will tell you what's the um, total cost of actually running through um, this model and what's the total outcome. Um, so this is another example, very similar to um, you know the one that I was showing you just now. I think these ones are drugs for cancer. Am I right? Yeah. 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 But the, you, what you will get is an, a total cost at the end of your 10 years, for instance. And the total qualities at the end of 10 years. And the same, you, I mean, this is, you know, when you are comparing the two interventions, when having this model, if you have a 10-year model, at the end of those 10 years, you will get 
total number of colleagues and total number of calls for intervention A. So for instance, I don't know, total number of call, colleagues and to total number of calls for this drug versus total number of colleagues and total number of calls for this drug. And this is what you get as an output of your model. And then compute the ICER. Which one, sorry? I don't hear. I'm sorry. They use no, no, no. The alternative to overcome some of the limitations are, as I was saying, using survival models to account for, you know, for kind of what has happened in the past for transition probabilities, but not that I'm aware of. Uh, anyway, you have here like another table in which you can see um, how the transition probabilities are. And basically, you know, always, they always sum up to one and then you have like starting state and finishing state and how they progress. So this can tell you, or from here you can see how the transition probabilities are simply constant and they don't change. They don't take into account what has happened in the previous cycles, okay? This is an example that you will find in uh, one of the textbooks that basically um, it's a 20 um, cycles model in which you have all of them start um, you have a cohort of patients um, that all of them start um, well um, in, in, uh, in the initial um, period and then in the following period two, um, 200 remain well, 500 become sick and 300 are dead. So you can see what's the progression of patients um, at this, um, at this um, <coughs> you know, in this specific model. For instance here, when I gave you the answer about what you get in the model, I was more thinking about, you know, running the model in Excel, okay? What you will get is basically, you know, the total colleagues and the total costs, but you can also compute them <coughs> for each of the cycles if you like. If you are interested in that, you can also do it, okay? To see how, you know, the total costs and the total colleagues probably progress, um, you know, along uh, as you move up in your cycles. Even. Right, I, um, in that case, I don't know exactly the utility weights that they were using, but then it would be 200. Okay, good, good question as an exercise. How would you come up to that total utility weight? Well, you don't have the utility weights here, but assume that you know them, okay? And the utility weights are utility weight for well, utility weight for sick, and utility weight for dead. This is zero, okay? But you have to multiply by how many of them are in each state, yeah? yeah. So you will have to say, well, I have 200 guys that, that, that remain well. So multiply this times the utility weight that is as, uh, attached to that state, okay? Plus 500 guys are in the sixth state and they have that much of a utility weight. And that's how you get the yeah. No, that's how you get the total one, the cumulative is the, this one, okay, this 898 is this one plus this one. The cumulative is anything that comes up like before. So this number is this one plus this one plus this one plus this one, plus, yeah, plus this one, okay? So it's the accumulation, yeah? Well, you will be given the probabilities. From here you can infer what the probabilities are because, you know, if 200 out of 1,000 go to the well state, it means that 20% of them, okay? If uh, five, 500 out of 1,000 go to the sixth state, it's 50%. So from here you can infer the probabilities. Okay? If, you were not, if you were just given that table, you could actually infer the probabilities from the number. Although you will, typically, you will typically be looking at your cohort of patients and then looking at probabilities of becoming or remaining sick, oh, sorry, of remaining well or becoming sick or dying. Okay. 
No, for each cycle, then you have to know, you know, how many will remain well. Then, in this case, okay, um, what happens in period two? Those 200 that are uh, well, where are they coming from? Definitely not from the dead state. But if we are allowing transition between sick and well, those 200? No, I don't mean that. I mean, um, um, they started sick and they became well. Yeah. Okay, but these 200 may be coming of people that, that were well before and remain well, yeah, as well as those that were sick yeah. and, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, become yeah. well. Okay, because any transitions between those two states are allowed. The ones that are not allowed, sorry, and also from well to dead and sick to dead are allowed, but the dead to other states are not allowed. This, if you're talking about this kind of treatment and repeated cycles, could you come, could you come to a conclusion that this treatment makes sense as long as you limit it to three cycles? Because after that, the incremental. That's what they do. <coughs> that's <coughs> sorry. That's what they do in uh, some. Um, studies, what they do, how many cycles you need to run yeah. for this to be cost effective. So. But, and, and indeed, if you run more cycles, it's no longer cost effective. Maybe. Or if you run more cycles, it becomes even more cost effective. Because yeah. it accounts for so longer. Yeah. Well, the curve may be. Yeah. So it's because in practice it's quite, uh, maybe it's different in oncology, but it's quite difficult in medicine to talk about treatment programs where you say, let's say, you have atrial fibrillation. Sorry, well, any questions there? Happy to help? Yeah? Can I, can I come back to you, like, and uh, let's continue? So I was just thinking that in practice it's quite hard in medicine to say, we're going to offer a treatment, and if it doesn't work, then we say goodbye. So you say an atrial fibrillation ablation program will do one operation. And if it works, that's great. And if it doesn't work, goodbye. In practice, that's not what's done. We don't. We accept people onto a program of treatment that might require further inputs and further inputs. But the economic analysis might say that's crazy. We should. It only makes sense to offer it once. I would say that we need the medical input to actually decide about the modeling and then see whether it's worth or not. Actually from an economic running. perspective, but I'm just saying the way we practice from an ethical perspective for most things is you don't say, we will accept you onto a program of treatment, but if it doesn't work, we'll tell you goodbye. But I don't know how, sorry, I don't, I'm not sure I understand how this relates to this. Uh, yeah. I was thinking of an example in my world of, of AF ablation, where Mark, like isn't for atrial ablation to as well, there is a limit in all this, especially even in US and all as well. Like after treat first time, you know, if a patient comes back with AFib, most of the times you start preferring on it or like a minor rather so than taking back the so Exactly. I mean, this is for you to actually tell us or tell whoever is going to be the research whether it's worth eff medically effective. And then, it's not me, and hopefully you will be doing the analysis, okay, but, you know, this is the medical side of it, but then we have to put everything together. Like, what you were saying before, sorry, before you asked me, what you were saying before, and I think he raised the point as well, some people actually look at, well, I'm looking at my study for 15 years. Does it make a difference if I look at my study and take 20 years? Does it become more effective? For some people, this work because they can prove that in the adding five more years it actually adds more cost effectiveness <coughs> because the <coughs> the health outcomes um, are actually also materialized as late as 10 years along the line uh, 20 years along the line what happens with regard to a career certificate you have a very high acute cost for implantation device but then there was Exactly. So, so you might want to take this approach. Le I'm going to start with 10 years, and then I want to see whether, if I consider a 15-year model, is actually cost-effective. But the big difficulty with new technology is usually when you're assessing it, you've only got, it's a new technology, by definition, so you only have a few years' history of what it achieves. It 
journey became clear, ten years after ICDs were being widely introduced, what their long-term benefits were. And that's one of the problems that we have in economy. But that's one of the problems in health, is that uh, in a lot of interventions actually take a long time to actually find out, you know, the implications. Uh, it's yeah. not easy, like, I mean, we rely on extrapolation, but in many cases when you want to have reliable data, you need to have a lot of, many years of experience because you can, before you can really say what's exactly the, you know, the effect of an intervention. So. Which is the problem of assessing it early in it. Yes. In, in fact, what happens, sorry, I have a few questions and I'll get back to you. Um, in fact, what happens is that many drugs, not many, but like few drugs are introduced into the market and then they are withdrawn. One of them was, uh, what's the name of that statin? Rosuvastatin? This one? It's in the market. So well, I think there was one statin that was withdrawn. I don't remember. Anyway, I thought there was one that was withdrawn from the market because it had like some side effects. Yeah. Or, but, you know, there might be, you know, other drugs in other areas for which they are introduced and they are proved through randomized control trials and uh, that they are good. But then after a bit, when more evidence comes, you know, into light, they happen not to be as good as they, they were. The cost of dying actually can be positive. The utility will be negative, but the cost, the cost before you die, <laughs> think about palliative care and all these, before you die, yes. you may actually incur in some costs. Yes. This, I guess this could happen, but if you think about the surgery, okay, you either live or die. Um, the cost of the surgery is the same for both, let's say, but then the cost of, uh, you know, post-operative treatment. But what happens with that? No, in that case, your costs are zero. So if this is a true, true reflection of what happens in real life, and there are no costs, these costs are not accounted in your cost. So the total cost is reduced. So the utility is zero. If you die, it's, it's zero. So you have on the, the sorry? That's tricky in the study, though, <laughs> if you intentionally do something. Um, I, I mean, it, it really depends on what you are considering. I mean, I, I would have said that a priori you always have positive, uh, positive costs and But then you have like a lot of people, like this is going to be as well captured in the probabilities, right? So I don't know what percentages you might, you know, be handling, but if that treatment actually will kill 20% um, and but will save 80%, then this also has to do with how cost effective it's going to be because these transition probabilities actually are important to say, you know, what's the outcome and the cost how this is going to affect the final numbers that you are comparing. Yeah? <coughs> sure? Okay. Shall we have a break? And shall we do like yesterday, like we start 10 minutes later because 
we run over like 10 minutes or so, so let's come back at 50. Okay, okay. <laughs> at two. Can you make sure that we have laptops with Excel? Yeah, because we will need to use it. Yeah? But you can adjust the costs to begin with. Oh. Uh, with the, you know, but if with we, can we make the model for prognosis, model for future? Uh, uh, in that case, I think. Um, let, me, let me just switch this off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 